From Advisory Board, we're bringing you a radio advisory. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Welcome to the third episode in our Financial Impact Series. Today, we're talking all about ambulatory surgery centers. And to have that conversation, I've brought my colleague, Megan Director. Hey, Megan. Hi, Ray. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here on the podcast. Well, I am certainly excited about this as well. I think you, as well as all of our team, knows that I am an avid podcast listener. I'd say in my pre-COVID life, I listened to podcasts walking all around my hometown of D.C. when we were on the road and traveling. And I think now that I have been working from home a lot more, I am spending just as much time listening to podcasts, except now it's while I'm cooking or attempting to cook or (laughs) running stairs to get my steps in. Well, it is awesome to have a fellow podcast nerd actually participating here on the pod. And we'll be talking about something that may seem nerdy, but is actually so fascinating when it comes to ASC strategy. So excited to have the opportunity to dive into something that I've been spending quite a bit of time on lately. Before we start talking about the financial impact now, Take me back to where ambulatory surgery centers were six months ago before the pandemic actually hit. Well, 2020 was actually already shaping up to be a really big year for ASCs. And uh, let me just provide some context here. When we talk about ambulatory surgery centers, there are a couple different models by which they operate. So some of them are independently owned by physicians, but a lot of times they're partnering with a management company or a hospital or healthcare system in order to provide these services outside of the hospital in a freestanding site. And we've actually seen some pretty significant growth in the past few years um, in the number of services that can be performed in ASCs, but also just in the number that are out there in the market. And the reason we're seeing this is honestly just more services are moving outpatient, leaving the hospital. And in the past, we were seeing this due to technology. We could discharge patients in the same day because we had better technology and services to do that. But now it's really driven by purchasers. So ASCs, they're lower cost. They're lower cost for CMS, for commercial payers, but also for patients who have to pay less in terms of co-pays. But I think another reason that we've seen some of the growth in this market, too, is they're just more accessible to patients. I, it, I try and imagine thinking about going into a hospital when you're having to have a procedure You have to deal with the ED, you have to deal with frantic people everywhere, the parking, we hear that all the time. An ASC is usually seen as pretty soothing, easy parking, convenient. And so it's not only lower cost for patients, but it's actually been seen as just an unaccessible alternative for many. Yeah, as someone who travels quite a bit to visit hospitals around the country, I can attest to the fact that parking is indeed a pretty serious challenge at most hospitals. And you know, CMS doesn't necessarily make these decisions just based on parking alone, but primarily because of this cost differential, they've been accelerating this shift outside of the hospital outpatient department, moving more services to the ASC covered list. And that's why I think 2020 was really shaping up to be such a a big opportunity for ASCs, because this year they're for the first time allowing some coronary interventions, so PCIs, in the ASC setting. And this is huge because it's really the first time that ASCs can get a stake in the cardiovascular service line, a really profitable market. Hmm. And they even added total knee replacement for this year as well. So as of a few months ago, there was a lot of excitement from existing ASCs, but also some interest from hospitals and physicians to understand what that opportunity would look like for themselves. 2020 was shaping up to be a high growth moment for ASCs. Mm -hmm. Now let's fast forward to today. What are some of the short-term implications that ASCs have been facing financially due to the pandemic? Yes, things were looking pretty rosy. And then as I think with every healthcare sector, COVID-19 hit. What's interesting with ASCs is that the COVID-19 crisis response has all but wiped out the ASC business. So if you think about the model of ambulatory surgery centers, by their nature, they're performing scheduled procedures, 
they're elective versus emergent. There isn't even an emergency department or an ICU bed for these patients. They're lower risk, and they can, for the most part, be discharged in the same day. So for most of these ASCs, these procedures have been put on hold, and so is their revenue. Now, I will say that CMS, um, you may have heard of their Hospital Without Walls program, so essentially issuing some temporary waivers to help with the capacity constraints of hospitals. And that's actually allowing ASCs to either bill as a hospital or partner with a healthcare system. So that seems great as an opportunity to take on some more cases, right? But from what I'm hearing, ASCs, especially in those hardest hit areas, they just haven't been able to capitalize on this as resources are being allocated toward COVID-19. As with hospitals, ASCs are not immune to PP shortages either. So that's why I'm hearing numbers from many ASCs that they're running at a fifth of capacity, hmm. one to two days a week at max, or in many cases, they've had to temporarily shutter outright. And this is really huge for ASCs. They are reimbursed less per case, so they've had to be highly efficient, high volume machines, honestly, to really maximize their profits. So if they're only producing one or two days a week, that's really going to be a hard revenue hit for them. ASCs are facing a lot of the same challenges that hospitals are facing, particularly with their elective procedures, which, to your point, have just completely grinded to a halt. I'm curious, has that actually changed the calculus of whether or not a health system would want to partner with an ambulatory surgery center? The calculus was already a bit challenging for many hospitals and healthcare systems. The fact is that the HOPD payment rates, so the hospital outpatient payment rates, can be significantly higher than the same case being performed in an ASC. So some of those new coronary interventions, they're being reimbursed at about 40% less mm. than they would be in the hospital outpatient setting. So understandably, a lot of health systems have not necessarily jumped at the chance to be paid less if they felt like they could still be performing those services in the hospital outpatient department, and honestly, where they can really manage the quality and safety of these procedures. However, what we've seen is in some markets where ASCs have been really active is that hospitals have felt they need to get into the ASC business in order to keep their physicians happy. For example, we've seen in some markets that physician groups are actually leaving employment in order to get into the ASC business, especially now that cardiovascular procedures can be performed there. So there are health systems that are probably right in the middle of this decision point right now when the COVID-19 crisis hit. And they're going to have to make some decisions based on how this plays out. My gut feel is that if they were in a market that was already so competitive for ASCs, they may still feel like they have to get into the business, but they're likely not going to be seeing them opening a new ASC in the next few months. And you are clearly living and breathing all things ASCs right now. I'm curious, is there anything that you've learned that has an impact on ASCs that might just surprise our listeners? Well, I think it's the fact that even if CMS says, you know what, ASCs, you can perform this new procedure and we're adding it to the ASC covered list, or during the crisis, we're giving you temporary waivers to perform procedures that you otherwise may not have been able to, it's actually really dependent on state regulations. If there are individual states that have certificate of need laws in place that prevent ASCs from offering certain services, it doesn't matter what CMS has said. And I think this is going to impact the short term right now in how ASCs are going to be able to respond to the crisis and if they can offload some of the capacity. But it's also going to change the economics going forward. I would not be surprised if there are groups using the fact that the COVID-19 crisis is going to lead to a backlog of procedures and some access issues, that they may use this as a lobbying opportunity for states that haven't yet aligned with CMS and allowing more services to be performed in ASCs. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next several months there. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break. Hi, I'm Chris with the Radio Advisory Team. On behalf of everyone at Advisory Board, thank you for everything you're doing to battle COVID-19. We want to help you celebrate the bright spots. Perhaps you've been amazed at how your teams, your peers, or your leaders are supporting you. 
perhaps a patient's words reminded you of why you do what you do. What bright spots are you seeing? We want to hear from you. Share your story at advisory.com slash thank you and view our message of thanks. Let's keep going down this path of what might happen in the next several months. We talked about the short term, but tell me a little bit more about what the financial impact on ASCs is going to be in the long term. Well, Ray, do you want to hear the bad news or the good news first? Oh, let's let's start with the bad news. Okay, well, I think there are several variables that are at play here, and I think no surprise the top one is just when can they start doing elective procedures again? And this is going to be very region specific. I know that you spoke with uh, our colleague Shay Pratt recently about this on another episode. And as he mentioned, programs are going to be looking to start with that backlog of existing patients, but also try and choose those procedures that aren't going to require as many resources that are still being relied upon to manage the COVID-19 crisis. And if you're an ASC in a region where you haven't yet hit that surge of patients, it may be a while before you can really ramp back up to capacity. But I think we're also going to have to keep an eye on how long CMS is going to keep those waivers in place that I mentioned earlier for ASCs, and if they leave any of those flexibilities in place. The third piece that I think is going to have a significant impact, but very different on different ASCs, is just the ownership structure. Hmm. So I mentioned earlier there are a couple different models in which the ASCs can be managed. This is where that bad news comes in. If you are a smaller independent shop, it may be really hard to weather this initial storm of the crisis. So you could really see that these smaller ASCs that just don't have the capital outlay of a management company that has a national footprint or a healthcare system that owns ASCs, they may actually have to look to seek shelter from one of those larger companies that has that national footprint and may actually be able to have the capital outlay to purchase one of these smaller firms right now. Now, if you also just opened your ASC or built out a cath lab to take advantage of some of these new procedures, you likely haven't been able to recoup that significant investment yet as well. So I just think we may see some more consolidation or closure as a result of this. And that's certainly something that we're going to be tracking with physician practices as well, where smaller, newer practices are certainly struggling. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what is the good news? (laughs) Well, the good news, and this is actually where, again, this is my nerdy researcher side here, but I think this is where it gets really interesting. So for those ASCs that do weather the storm, that are able to manage their finances through this initial crisis where they can't perform elective procedures, they may actually find themselves in an environment that is more favorable to ambulatory surgery centers. So here I'll explain. In the midterm, once elective procedures start to ramp back up, ASCs will actually be in a really good position to capture that backlog of procedures that hospitals don't have the capacity to quickly reschedule. And ASCs are already really used to being able to have several procedures done at very high throughput, very efficiently, that they can get onto the schedule more quickly. So they may be able to take on some of those services that the hospitals just aren't able to get to as quickly. And we talked about this with Shay, but it's also likely that patients are probably just going to see ambulatory surgery centers as a safer alternative to the hospital, particularly a hospital that has seen a pretty significant surge of COVID patients. Definitely. I think we're already starting to see that. And I think it's no longer going to be just the parking that is going to be seen as preferable for the ASCs. It's going to be seen as a a safer alternative that is off the hospital campus and away from the ICUs and EDs. It can oftentimes feel like all of this financial impact is just out of leader's control. What should ambulatory surgery center leadership actually be doing right now? Uh, Do you want me to to answer this from the hospital leader's perspective over ASCs or from the independent ASCs? Once again, let's do both. Let's start with the hospital leader side. Sure. So if you're a hospital leader and you're overseeing your ASC or ambulatory strategy for the health system, I would really think about how are you going to be able to demonstrate to patients and to those referring physicians that you can offer patients 
safe care. And by safe, I don't just mean quality and outcomes, but now looking at safety as protection from exposure to COVID-19. So that could be part of your COVID-19 response strategy for the health system, is that especially during the time where you are still seeing COVID-19 patients, you have an alternative access site for patients to receive care as they need it. So a lot of it will be that communication to make sure that patients and referring physicians still feel comfortable getting urgent care when they need it. Hmm. How about if you are a leader over an independent ASC? It's, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's the independent ASCs that might be seeing a, a bit more financial challenges right now. So they're going to have to really think what are the circumstances in which they may be looking to partner or be acquired by either a health system or one of the larger ASC management companies, because that decision point may have to come sooner than they would have initially expected. And they'll want to make sure that they're thinking through it in a really principled strategy that would still allow them some of the benefits that they've had and the autonomy of managing their own ASC. So Megan, this has been a great conversation. I've got one final question for you, and it's one that I'm asking everyone on the podcast. What advice would you give to executives this week? So I would encourage all healthcare executives to think about where you can provide the safest, most timely care to patients who need that essential, if not technically emergent services. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, safety is not just about outcomes for the procedure, but reducing risk of exposure to COVID-19. So in some cases, this may be in the hospital, but there's a good chance that it may now be in ASCs or freestanding imaging centers or telehealth. And we just need to adopt a strategy that looks more holistically at the full continuum of care options for patients in order to treat them safely and efficiently. And that mandate is not going to end when this crisis does. Well, Megan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How excited are you as an avid podcast listener to actually be able to be on one? I am very excited. I will certainly be posting about this on LinkedIn and to the family text chain. <laughs> well, we look forward to having you back. Thank you so much, Ray. Thanks for tuning in to the third episode in our financial impact series. Next week, we're tackling the financial impact on physician practices. And if you missed our earlier episodes on COVID-19's impact on hospitals or payers, be sure to give those a listen. And as always, we're here to help. I like how we've created this universe where Ray's obsessed with parking. <laughs> <laughs> parking and getting lost in hospitals.